what's happening welcome to the 12th installment the the year the completion of a year i don't know how to say that it's not like we have an anniversary yet that would be the next one but our 12th installment of martial arts radio live which we're we're kind of rebranding we're calling it whistle kick live because it has become so much more than an offshoot of martial arts radio it is really the 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 amalgamation there's a word for you there's a two dollar word of everything that's going on at whistle kick it's live it's social media it's first cup it's all of it it's everything it's everything that we've got so Thank you for joining us. Looks like we've got a bunch of people in the chat. I want to thank everybody. I'm not going to name names because I don't feel like reading 18 different names to all of you. That just seems silly. But if you're in the chat, you know you are. Thanks for joining us. If you're listening or watching later, you should be joining us the first Tuesday of the month, 8 p.m. Eastern U.S. time on Facebook. So thanks, everybody. Anybody in the chat remember the first episode, the first Whistle Kick Live, when I was in the warehouse? This would have been October. Would have been October of 2019. We were in the warehouse. I set everything up, and it was the last time I was out there that it wasn't stupidly cold because the warehouse is currently unheated. And let's see. Andrew says, yes. All right. Well rock on. I don't remember what we talked about, though. That's the other half. That's the other half of what Gabe's asking here. I have no idea. I just remember being out there. I remember being completely out of my element, not knowing what was, what was going on. We did it natively with the Facebook app. We weren't using this, this fancy-dancy software that we use now, ManyCam. And, man, the show is really changed it's progressed a lot and in no small part thank you to you can't see him but he's right there to me gabe see you he's my my producer my my other my other half my right hand it's just it just was yeah andrew says i think there were only four people watching that might be generous uh <laughs> hi tommy stacy was i don't believe it was with with master goodall i don't think we did that with him. We did that. He showed up for 400. Is that the last time he showed up to a show? Maybe. I don't know. Andrew says, your nervousness was palpable. It has really come a long way. Well, thank you, Andrew. And uh, a little bit of foreshadowing. You might be, you might be seeing and hearing more of Andrew coming soon. We talked about some today. We got, we got to talk more next week, but I am excited. What else we got? What else? What else are we doing? Of course, Gabe was there, but he showed up late because you couldn't figure out how it worked. Man, talk about I've come a long way. I've come a long way from being really nervous on, on live to uh, the guy who couldn't figure out how to how to show up to a Facebook video running the show here. <laughs> you can't see him, but he's laughing, taking shots at him, and he likes it. I mean, talking about a martial arts thing, right? You take shots at the people you love, and they are happy for it. It's a weird thing that we do. Thanks for kicking me in the head. A few other things that we talked about back then were, should black belt tests be open or closed to outside? So I know why I yawn. It's because I don't breathe in between. I need to slow down, take some breaths in between, and I won't yawn as much. So a few of the things that we talked about were, should black belt tests be open or closed to outsiders? How to deal with kids forced to attend classes. That's come up again recently. Funny training stories. We've talked about a lot through this these eleven months and, and we're gonna we're gonna keep this thing going. It's fun. We get slightly more people each time. It it seems like we're on to something. What did you think of Joe Rogan's comparison of video games? To martial arts. Did we talk about this last time? I feel like we did or we started to. And I needed context. There was something. Here it is. And video games are a real problem. You know why? Because they're fun. I have a real problem with them. They're real exciting, but you don't get anywhere. You could learn jujitsu, and then three years later, you're an elite jujitsu athlete. By the way, it takes more than three years. 
or you could just be playing video games. Three years later, you could be that same kid just playing video games. I mean, you could. I, I, I enjoy video games. I go through phases with them. Uh, I, at times in my life when I felt like what I have doesn't really fit any rules, video games are really nice because video games have rules. Maybe there's, they're crazy rules, but they're, they're generally consistent. And I don't play them very much right now because I got a lot to do. Looking back, I promise I'll try to stop. Looking back, uh, none of the time I invest in video games moved, moved the needle forward on anything. I got stuff I'm trying to do. I need that time. Video games, uh, a lot of the things that I have in my life, I'm sure a lot of the things that you have in your life are escapes. They are uh, tempering the stress. It's, it's to help you balance out life because it can't always be work all the time. Matt's asking for my favorite all-time game. That is easy, the original StarCraft. Such a great game. And the game that I'm going back to, kind of chipping away at, playing a little bit here and there, StarCraft 2, because I never actually played it. And you can get it for free from Blizzard if you go check that out. What do you think of the saying, you either win or learn, you never lose? I like that saying. As human beings, we are innately, uh, we learn by making mistakes. If you think about the way a child learns, they, they learn to walk by falling. They learn to run by falling. They learn things are hot by burning. You know, it's, we, we make these mistakes. We try things, they don't work out. That is how we're wired to learn. That's what happens in martial arts. You learn, hey, I got punched in the face. I should probably keep my hands in a different spot. You know, stuff like that. And so to embrace that as you win or you learn, I think you learn either way. But I'll be honest, I think you learn more when you lose or you fail. Because think about it. If you win, you have discovered something that will work. Might not be the best way. But when you lose, when you fail, when it doesn't go right, you have learned something that you can cross off your list. And my theory on life is that over time, you start to hone in on the things that work for you. So if you think about it as a pie chart, right? We're tightening up the options that you have. And this is why when you survey people for happiness, folks in their 60s are usually the happiest. Why? Because they know what they like, they know what they don't like, they're healthy enough to do those things, and they usually have enough disposable income to do them. Right? So by making mistakes, we learn what works, what we like, what does it? And what we don't. So, yeah. Uh, Matt says, not a fan. Knowing that you lose can be humbling. It's also insensitive to keep trying to be better. Gabe says, Gabe responds, also, I learn if I win too. So I don't like how that phrase limits learning to losing. I don't think it's necessarily limiting. I think it, I think it changes the priority. I think when someone walks out of uh, any kind of competition, victorious, especially if they win an overwhelming victory, they don't generally sit down as their first priority and say, all right, what could I have done better? But when you lose, assuming you lose in a healthy way, that tends to be what people think. Jason's in the chat. I had a demo. I just advanced. I had a demo team member skip practice to go to a video game tournament. I asked him why I shouldn't kick him off the team. And all he could say was, I won $3,000. And he showed me the check. <laughs> Andrew's chiming in on this subject. Edison found lots of ways of things that didn't work before the light bulb was created. Something like 10,000 failed filaments, failed materials for the filament in a conventional light bulb before he discovered what worked. Right on. Here's a great question. Do you celebrate rank tests 
anniversaries. Do you celebrate that? The, you know, five years ago, I earned my purple belt or my black belt or whatever. I don't. Does anybody else? The only date that's in mind for me is the date that I started karate. Oh, I apologize. I am much more yawny than normal. <sighs> my, oh, we're, we're just a few days off. Uh, September 6th, 1983 is when I started martial arts. Gabe says he recently celebrated the one-year anniversary of, of his black belt. You only been a black belt for a year? Wow. Okay. I feel like it's been longer. There's nothing wrong with celebrating anniversaries. There's plenty of value there. If you're, especially if you're celebrating the work, you're celebrating the growth, you're reflecting on what's happened since, I think there's a lot of value there. We've got a brand new segment. Like I said at the top of the show, one of the things that we're trying to do with Whistlekick Live is collect all the various aspects of what we do. Now, one of the things that we do, of course, we have Marshall Journal, marshalljournal.com. And I don't know if this has gone live yet on Marshall Journal, but one of the goals is that we're going to start telling the stories, the funny stories, the entertaining stories that happen during class, behind the scenes, whatever, at martial arts schools. And you'll be able to find those on marshalljournal.com. Matt is the one who has stepped up to lead that effort. And here's the first one. As a young instructor of maybe 14 to 15 years old, we had a class dedicated to three to five-year-olds, little dragons. One of the little boys asked to use the bathroom. About two minutes later, he came running out, underwear and pants in hand, asking for help. Uniform, top, and belt tied on tight. I had to run over, swoop him up, and take him to the back to help him put on his pants. That's phenomenal. And I want to give a special shout out to Matt for uh, including himself in this, this first story here. Uh, I don't know that I would have had the maturity to handle that at 14, 15 years old. Uh, I, I might have started laughing. I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't have. But that's pretty great. Anybody who spent time teaching small children knows that they are ripe with ridiculous stories. I'll tell you what. Uh, Gabe, you want to throw something up? I'm going to go get it, grab a quick drink and bring that in. I think that'll help me with my yawning. What's what's the next thing? No, what's what's the next thing? Put let's let's go to the next topic and put that up. And that way people can talk about something. I'll be like maybe 30 seconds. And I'm back again with our unofficial sponsor, Spindrift. The seltzer with juice. That's my slogan for it. Uh, thanks for indulging me. This is one of the things that we have on this show. Is It's, it's unscripted. It's raw. You never know what's going to happen. It's part of the fun. This is the joy of live TV. Oh. We missed that one. Got another one. I, I didn't know I didn't know we had so many stories. thought we only had one story. Three stories. Three stories from Matt. All right, next story. One of the black belts when I was climbing up the ranks was super goofy and a pain in the butt during class. So on sparring days, his peers would beat the crap out of him. <laughs> one time during sparring, he got sidekicked, lifted into the air, and was flying into the locker room. When he realized he was leaving the floor, he tried to turn and salute as he went into the back. <laughs> that is good stuff. That's someone with a lot of awareness. There's a lot of time in the air, too. Good stuff. <sighs> I'm trying to think if I have any stories like that. I'm sure I do. I never think of them on the spot, though. I, I, I had a school for two years. I don't know. Everybody was just goofy. Not not in any like specific ways. They were just silly. I let them be silly. As long as they were working hard. I didn't care. And I think this is the one that was up while I went out. 
I was running a knife defense section of class. One of the kids called out, I don't know how to do this, as I was demonstrating. I said, you gonna learn today? My kid muttered real low, all right, all right, all right. Oh, <laughs> probably the Matthew McConaughey way. All right, all right, all right. A few of the adults heard it and laughed aloud. That's good stuff. I like that. Good times. I think UPS is in my driveway. UPS shows up late. What's next? What do we got? All right, here's a good one. Pick a famous martial artist. If you could go back to the beginning of their journey, knowing what you do now, what would you tell them? And how do you think it might change their approach? This is a fun twist on some of the questions that we ask on martial arts radio. Ooh. See, it requires a, a, a certain arrogance, confidence is the right thing. You know, let's, let's pick the, the quintessential example. If I went back to the beginning of Bruce Lee's journey, what would I tell him? Now, I don't know that he would have necessarily come up with Jeet Kune Do if I, you know, messed with that. The, the whole butterfly effect and everything. If you're not familiar with that, the idea that time travel can change things. The idea that we end up where we are because of all of the things that come before, including some of the smaller ones. So how do we handle that? I don't know. Got a bunch of people writing in here on the chat. Looks like the chat's pretty active tonight. Good times. I had a girl claim a wrist lock wasn't working, so she stood up and broke her own wrist. <laughs> I like that. Uh, what else we got in the chat? Am I a bad person for thinking that's funny? No, Jenny, you're not. I think that's funny. It's not... It's not funny that they got hurt. It's funny. It's funny because we've all dealt with people like that. That doesn't work. That doesn't hurt. You're doing it wrong. And sometimes people just need to be knocked down a peg. Martial arts is a great opportunity for that because we, we all we all need to experience that humility. We all need to recognize that, you know, we're human. We're fallible. And sometimes life doesn't dish that out. Martial arts does. This is exactly what I needed. Uh, apparently, this needs to go on the pre-show list. Jeremy needs to have a can of spin drift. I could tell my goose story. I'll tell my goose story. Have I not told me? Did I tell you this like on the phone or something? All right, the goose story. I've told it on martial arts radio. I don't know. I did? Okay. Well, for those of you that maybe haven't heard the goose story, here's the goose story. I I was young. I was no more than five. Maybe I'd started martial arts. I'm not sure. And my mother had a business partner who lived on a farm. And at the farm was a goose that was really mean. And the goose wouldn't just, you know, be a little territorial. The goose would hide and attack you. And it was a mean goose. So when we would pull up to the farm before we got out of the car, we'd get pretty close to the door. And my mother would ask me, because I'd be in the passenger seat, because this is before the days when kids had to be in the back seat, right? This is, I, this is, there's no... There's no booster seat, no nothing. Like, I'm strapped in. The, the, the seat belt's around my eyes. You know. Jeremy, do you see the goose? No. And we'd get out and we'd go in. And so this particular day, Jeremy, do you see the goose? No. So, get out of the car. We're walking in. And the goose comes charging out. And you, you know, if you've seen Jurassic Park, you know how the velociraptors, like, put their head down and they're like, ah, and they're really aggressive and they charge you. This is what this goose was doing. And my mother doesn't even miss a beat, picks me up by the arms, tees up and clubs the goose with my feet. Now, I don't think my mother has ever played golf in her life, but this was probably as 
picture perfect a swing as one could have with a small child as a driver. And uh, then we went inside and the farmer was there laughing his butt off. That's a good story. I don't know how martial arts it is. I don't think my mother was training at that point, but good story. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's move on. What's the next one? If anybody else has stories, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll keep reading them through through uh, through the episode. How I think looking how words, Jeremy. How I think I look during self defense. And for those of you who might be listening, it was a picture of a small child executing a, a brilliant flip of a much larger person. And then this next one. After I walk through a spider web, the guy's rubbing at his face. Yeah. Is there anything that is more instantly debilitating than having a spider web on your face? I can experience incredible pain, heat, um, you know, the need to suppress a, a burp or, or a hiccup, but it does not matter what's going on, where I'm at. If we hit a spider web, Boom, it's just, it's instantaneous. You got to deal with it. And this is one of the most perfectly constructed GIFs I've ever seen. It's almost seamless. Very well done. Whoever made this GIF. What else we got? All right. Seems like, uh... all right. Try coming back in. Gabe lost his controls. There we go. Now he's back. That that was a great a great place to lose it. Right in the middle of that that gif going wild. <laughs> I thought something was going on. I was like, why'd you choose to leave it there? That's silly. We're getting situated. Again, this is the beauty of live TV on a budget. Here we go. Forms. How do you make them exciting for someone who doesn't particularly enjoy them? I had a conversation with with uh, with a gentleman that I met via Twitter. We were on the phone last week, week before, I don't remember. And he was asking this same question. And we had a pretty good chat about it. And it looks like we got lots of comments on this one. So let's, let's see what people had to say and then I'll give you my thoughts. Gabriel, different Gabe, says Bunkai. Understanding the application, the, the practical usage of forms can make them a lot more entertaining for people. Laura says, we do things like change directions, do them really fast, really slow, or balance a cup on your head while trying to do them. In the summer, if outside, we fill the cup with water. We do them tournament style, give scores, do them with a, a partner who is attacking. We'll put tape on the floor and have them try to start and stop in the same spot or do them blindfolded. We'll play Don't Die, where they are pretending to be ninjas. And if anyone messes up in their group, they all die and they have to do push-ups to come back to life. Bonus points to whichever group makes it the furthest in their patterns. Bonuses get you out of having to do push-ups. Lots of options there. And it reminds me, we've done an episode. Uh, I want to say it's like 25, 20 ways to practice forms because they don't always have to be the same way. You don't practice your basics the same way. You don't train for sparring the same way. Doing your forms exactly the same way every time. Missing the point. Matt says, change how you do the form. Mirror image, slow motion, face new directions, self-defense after each line. Partner tried to distract you backwards. Or I'll work on how to apply the form. Make it a mini contest of sorts. Tag forms. One person starts. Every time a key up, the other person picks up where they left off. Great. Gabe responds, man, I love your creativity. We've done the partner distraction one too. I also had a couple of people spar around the person doing their form. Ooh, I like that. And Matt replies to that. Another one of my favorites with more advanced students is have them figure out how to do an open hand form with their weapons or a weapons form open hand. Ooh, I like that. Now, of course, I don't know how many of you know John, but I went to high school with John and John Schuttinger says filling out forms is never fun. And to make that statement even better, guess who John works for? Federal government. <laughs> Jason time, chimes in with a, a good one here. 
I would insert myself into the movements in sort of a self-sacrificial, sometimes crazy or silly way, and then eventually work up to becoming the person on the receiving end of the applications. This was born one night when I noticed pretty much the entire class was not raising their knee high enough to perform middle front snapping kicks. So I shouted, hey, don't kick me in the head, and waited for a student to bite. And they did. Mr. Jason, would we kick you in the head with a middle front kick? Before they could finish, I ran over, lay down on the ground right in front of their kicking foot, and then yelled, because you are not raising your knee high enough. Do your front kick, please. Of course, they tried to back up. So I moved right along with them. There is no step back in this part of the form. It is a middle front kick. So do a middle front kick and pick up your knee. As soon as they picked up their knee, I reminded them loudly, don't kick me in the head. And I would roll out and comically cover my head. After I knew everyone was watching, I let them do the kick. And before they could react, I yelled, don't step on my face. So long and short, the session, long and short, the lesson was keep your kicking knee up high before and after the kick. Jason, I know you're in the chat. Um, if you could record a video of that, just showing us what that looks like, that would be great. I'd love to show that on the next episode. Some really good stuff there. So, um, can somebody grab the episode of Martial Arts Radio that we did talking about forms? Somebody dropped that in the chat, or Gabe, maybe you can grab that if you do a search for, uh, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio forms or training forms or something like that. I like forms. I think forms are really important. I think anybody who is discounting forms is probably missing what the point is. Forms aren't just needless practice of sequence of movements. Why do we do basics? So when it comes time to use basics, sparring, self-defense, to use those techniques, they're more instilled in us. Why do we do forms? To practice those sequences. You're not generally going to go from a low, blo low block to a high block behind you. You don't see that in forms. But what do you see? Low block, step and punch. Low block, kick. Sequences that you might use. So by practicing them in the forums, you are drilling those combinations over and over and over again so that when it comes time to use them, you'll use them. On top of that, you've got all those other benefits. Episode 162 is the episode you want to check out. Thank you, Gabe. If you're someone who doesn't practice forms, I would like to suggest your entirety of what you consider your martial arts training will get better with the application of forms. You could make them up. They could be completely based on your own techniques. Forms are good. All right, so next thing, we, we've got something kind of special. So as, as you saw earlier, we're bringing in new elements to the show. We're bringing in people. We're bringing in lots of things here. And... Hold on, because I got to make sure Medicam, where's Medicam? I got to make sure that the audio is working because uh, I had Jared muted. All right, let me, let me introduce this real quick and then we'll, we'll chime it up. Oh, I got, I got bug-eyed Jared Pause staring at me. <laughs> uh, like I said. We're bringing in different elements, different people, friends of Whistlekick, friends of the show, etc. And here we've got a clip from Jared Wilson. This is uh, edited down from a longer clip, which um, which he sent in. And we're going to give you different pieces over the next couple episodes alive. Because, hey, let's make this about more than me. And... Go ahead, hit it, Gabe. Hello, whistle kick listeners. Whistle kickers? I don't know. I think we need to come up with a name for people that listen to whistle kick. Uh, my name is Jared Wilson. I'm a friend of Jeremy's and a fellow martial arts podcaster. I run the Martial Thoughts podcast, which I like to delve deep into the academic and philosophical side of martial arts. And one of the things I've been mentally ruminating on recently is, what does it mean to be a black belt? And the answer is, uh, is everything and nothing simultaneously. 
it can mean everything in the world to you and mean absolutely nothing to anybody else in the world. And that's kind of the way it should be. But at the same time, we have to be able to describe what a skill level of a martial artist as a black belt should be, as a shodan should be. There's even different levels of fluency. You know, to use myself, both I and William Shakespeare are fluent in English. But there's a huge difference in the level of our wordsmithing. But that's what we should be striving for in being a black belt, is being fluent in your martial art. So, my name is Jared Wilson. Try out Martial Thoughts Podcast, and thank you for your time. Hello. Oh, we don't we don't want that on loop. That'd be a, that'd be a little much. <laughs> Just a loop of ninety seconds of Jared Wilson. Jared's in the chat. He's a good friend. I I uh, I like picking on him. He picks on me back quite a bit. We become good friends, and that's one of the things that I like. You know, you can you can train with people, and you can become friends that way. Or apparently, you can uh, have competing podcasts. We're doing different stuff and reaching different people and there's some overlap, but uh, the friendship that's come from our collaborations really mean a lot to me. So thanks for submitting that, Jared. And I'm hoping we're going to start to include more and more people. The more people we get involved in this show, the better it's going to be. All right. And I think this was another holdover topic from last time as well. Why is gardening often associated with the martial arts? What would it be? if the martial arts were developed today. Mm. So I think we got a couple things here. A lot of times people associate gardening with martial arts because of the weapons, the traditional Japanese Okinawan weapons of Kabuto. They're primarily garden implements. And I think if martial arts were developed today, we'd have a lot of those. We'd have, you know, sticks and knives and I don't know, maybe a chainsaw. I thought about going to a competition and doing a chainsaw form. I could probably get one of those kid chainsaws that don't have the chain on them and they just make the noise. That could be fun to do. Matt has a, a kind of a better answer today. It may have to do with the Zen of gardening or the counterbalance to being a strong martial artist, being super gentle and caring. Jenny had another good point. That, that is martial artists that as martial arts were being developed, a lot of people were farmers. Hey, that's kind of what I said. Most of our weapons are even based from farming and gardening tools. Apparently Jenny and I are sharing a brain tonight. <laughs> Matt says he'd love to watch that. Jason says cultivation comes to mind. Of course, the old saying, it's better to have a warrior in the garden than a garden a gardener in the war. That said, I do not want to discount the multidiscipline approach of some martial arts cultures. Thinking of the samurai, they had to be well-versed in the military arts, but they also studied things like flower arrangement, gardening, cooking, and other disciplines to supplement their craft. I think there is a lot of wisdom there. Gardening is meditative. It is productive. It is... It requires focus and attention. It's you are nurturing something. You are literally creating life in a pretty low consequence way. I think there's a lot that can be gained from that discipline. You show me someone who's got a beautiful flower garden or a vegetable, you know, a really productive vegetable garden. And I'll show you someone who has a lot of discipline, someone who pays attention to the minutia of what's going on. They're observant. There are a lot of qualities that come from that that are relevant as martial artists. Good stuff. Jared says, and Jared would know, most of the secondary skills of the samurai came about after the wars had ended. That makes sense. <laughs> and here we have, we have a commercial for First Cup. And there's there's Gabe with his first cup mug. Uh, we've got a few first cup mugs floating around out there. You can get yours at whistlekick.com. What are they? Twelve ninety nine, thirteen ninety nine, with shipping. And of course, Gabe's got his whistlekick T-shirt on at the same time. I have to get another whistlekick shirt because I've been working out, and this one was hard to put on. I, I need I need bigger shirts. 
Mm, Chuck Norris joke of the month. I like that. Let's do that. <laughs> when the boogeyman goes to bed at night, he checks for Chuck Norris. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. You know, I am fearful for what will happen when Chuck Norris passes away. What will happen to these jokes? Will they fall out of favor? I hope not. I really hope not. Oh, this is a great question. I love this. Did you come up with this one? This is brilliant. If you could do one technique better than anyone else, what would it be? Oh, see, I'm torn. I'm torn between some crazy tricking, jumping, flipping thing that would be really fun to pull out at parties or something really simple like a reverse punch that you could use all the time. Something that has far more utility but less impressive quality. Hmm. Gabe says he got the idea from something I say. Everyone has something they're better at than anyone else. It's true. Hmm. Jason says sidestep. Stacy says dodging front snap kick. Matt says probably something simple like a front leg side kick. But. <laughs> And this is a great option too. <laughs> crane kick, Karate Kid crane kick. Um, you know that that whole thing where people ask you, "What, you know? Oh, you do martial arts? Show me a move." This is what I do. I just, I just do that. And they're like, "Oh, not that one." I was like, "Well, what's wrong with that one?" And if they don't like that one, I just walk away. Oh, turn and walk away. Matt reminds us that Mr. Miyagi said, if do right, no can defense. Oh, this is fun. This is fun. You've got some good stuff for us today. I appreciate that. Caption this as if you didn't know martial arts. And it's Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris from, uh, which movie is it? It's not. It's not Enter the Dragon, is it? Yes, it is Enter the Dragon. The Bruce Lee movies blur together for me a little bit. Jared says his preferred technique would be Master Ken's Death Stare. Tommy says Single Whip. Um, Jenny says Chuck Norris. He's, she's questioning if he will pass away. And a bunch of others are agreeing with that. <laughs> All right. Put that graphic up, back up if you would. There we go. So we're captioning this as if you didn't know martial arts. And, oh, can't do that. I'm trying to move this out of the way so I can see what Jason said. Uh, <laughs> what is this? Some sort of no shirt, bare chest, and hairy chest dance party? <laughs> I like it. Um, what would mine be? Um, I'm, I'm I'm playing on on Bruce Lee's face. Something like, "You look like you need a bathroom," because they both look like they need a bathroom. Chuck looks like he has to poop. I can't not see that with that face. But the whole shirtless thing, yeah, that's. Jared says, "Chuck, that's how you t that's how you tango." Oh, I like that. And Andrew's saying it's from Way of the Dragon, not Enter the Dragon. I am far from the authority on anything. On anything. If I'm the authority on anything, it's on asking you ridiculous questions that make you think. If your martial arts journey was a movie, 
which one would it be? Well, I'd want it to be something dramatic like Crouching Tiger. Um, but it'd probably be closer to something like, um, hmm. Probably closer to something like 36 Chambers where lots of cheesy dialogue and a couple good fight scenes and everybody's picking on everybody else. It's probably probably what it really is. Oh, we get we got the commercials rolling here. I like that. Commercial time. Got an actual Amazon review for our helmets, because we use really soft foam. This product is very well made and fit perfectly a 72-year-old female, very round head, size large. I got this helmet for her because she falls often and had received a head injury from her last fall. She uses this whenever she leaves the house now for protection. The foam is thick enough for adequate cushion from any blow to the head and is comfortable. If your head is very large, you may want to go with an XL. This helmet is very snug on an adult female head and a, has a Velcro trim strap. Now, fun fact about that review, because we've had a few of these reviews. Um, Somehow along the way, whistle kick helmets became the go-to for some um, special needs therapists in schools because the foam that we use is a lot softer. And instead of putting someone in a hard plastic helmet, they put them in a whistle kick helmet. And you know what? When I was designing them, I had no idea that would ever happen, but I'm super pumped that people find value in them. So, yay, that's great. We got some other, some some mentions of movies that people would, would describe their, <laughs> describe their life as Way of the Fat Dragon, uh, Foot Fist Way, Foot Fist Way, Meets never back down in a sprinkle of blood and bone, circle of iron, and uh, and a lot of laughter. <sighs> what would you be doing now if what you'd thought you'd be doing as a white belt actually happened? I have no idea. Um, it was way too long ago. I was far too young. Probably thought I'd be Superman or something. I don't know. I went through a phase where I thought Aquaman was cool because I had an Aquaman t-shirt. I don't remember. I bet most of you have better better answers. Andrew's movie would be Kung Pao. <laughs> That's an awful movie. It's such a bad movie. I saw it in the theater. I actually dragged some of my non-martial arts friends to see it and they were not impressed. And we've got some answers for this one. Andrew says, if the pandemic hit as a white belt, I likely wouldn't have stuck with it. Uh, Gabe says, that's not what we meant. <laughs> uh, I don't remember what I did or felt last week, let alone when I was 14. Ha! Jason says, well, the first time I was a white belt, I got kicked out of class by my dad. I think I thought I was just supposed to go to class so I could look like what I saw in Kung Fu Theater. When I began training in high school, my motivation was to be able to quickly dispatch someone. In junior high school, one of the local gang members showed up to cut someone. I was not involved, but I was standing there minding my own business when the other guy decided to run behind us. My high school also had a reputation, and sadly, the way to ensure you would not be messed with, beat the crap out of the other person. So, to answer the question, the teenage white belt me would be in jail for sure. Fortunately, I never had to deal with anything other than trash talk. Very fortunate. Obviously, a lot of people get into martial arts because, you know, for, for those sort of reasons. And it's a good thing that doesn't happen most of the time. I think one of the things, maybe not universal, but pretty darn close, is the idea that we start martial arts for a reason and we discover many reasons to continue. And quite often, that reason we start has nothing to do with why we remain. Oh. This is th I think this question is going to trigger some people. All the ones who say, I don't do forums now. 
if you were only allowed to do one form for the rest of your life, which one would it be? Now, I know some people who really skew their training into certain forms, not for competition, but uh, for example, I know someone, uh, if you know Nahanshi or uh, the, the, the Techie series, uh, which I can never remember the Taekwondo name. It's the one that long, it's, it's the form along the wall. Uh, I know someone uh, who says they continue after decades to discover new bunkai buried in those forms. And I suspect that you could, you could do the same thing with any form. If you go deep enough, you spend enough time with it, you will continue to find more and more nuance, especially as you explore it for your body and you continue to um, open yourself to what that form can be. Um, Andrew says his answer is an Anaku from Shornru. And a, a, a great a great answer, gonna go back to a, a former question. Uh, this is from Stacy. She started so because she couldn't get good photos of breaks. She's a very talented photographer. Uh, Tommy says dragon form or Yang Tai Chi long form. Andrew's also making a second vote for Saison. For me, it would be Kusanku, uh, the Ishinru Kusanku, because it's my favorite form. Uh, second choice would probably go to Empi because it's my second favorite form. But I'm at a point now where I could doesn't mean I wouldn't get bored, but I could continue to find value in practicing just about any form consistently. Kevin's in the chat saying all forms have the hidden techniques. I agree. I agree. I, I think I think finding one that works for you, one that you can kind of make your own and lean on at times, I think that's valuable. Dennis says, mine too. <laughs> Stacy says, what's the crazy form you do that almost has a death drop? That's uh, that's Kuzanku. Uh, Stacy's seen me do that in competition. And uh, there are there, there are a few liberties taken with it. So, flashed it up a little bit. Matt says his creative double chuck form. Matt, let's get that on video. I want to see it. And we're starting to starting to roll down here. It's been it's been a solid hour, over an hour if we count the previews. If your school or style had a mascot, ooh, who or what would it be? I like that. Well, you know, I get to cheat because if we had a school, it would be the whistle kick school, the whistle kick training academy dojo quan school. And it would be Master Hopkick. And so nobody can pick Master Hopkick as their as their mascot. Eric would pick his traditional comma form. Tommy's mascot would be a monkey. Gabe specified that it had to be not inherently martial arts related. Matt saying, we had a stuffed dragon at one point, but that's a little cliche. I'd love something like a turtle, armadillo, or a fox. Ooh, armadillo. An armadillo would be an interesting, would make for an interesting martial artist. That might make a fun question for next time, talking about the personification of animals and how they would do it in martial arts. Maybe we'll tackle that one. Stacy says, an origami crane. Panda, a crane. <laughs> Jared tried to say Master Hopkick. <laughs> oh. No, I think this is a good place to start to wind down. There's no rule that says we have to we have to go right to nine o'clock. I can I mean I could fill the time, but I don't think we have to do that. This has been a good episode. This has been good stuff. And, you know, I think one of the one of the things I, I want to say is that those of you in the chat tonight were were on it with your comments, with your with your all the different discussions. Oh, uh, Hedgehog. 
from Jared. I like that. Uh, it makes it more fun for me to have to have stuff to have feedback from all of you to go on. Kind of rounds it out instead of me just saying what comes to mind. I've got stuff from from all of you, and and if you see me looking over here, that's why. So I've got computer here, camera, and I've got my laptop over here. Uh, because if you remember the early episodes, uh, I screwed up the audio as we tried to to do all this, and uh, not doing that anymore because we run it on a separate computer and I mute it, so it can't happen. Well, I want to put a plug in for First Cup tomorrow morning, 6.30 a.m. Eastern on YouTube, and come join us for a different style of live show. Uh, I will be tired and drinking coffee, and it's kind of like an ask me anything sort of style thing, so... Come check that out. We do that every weekday. Have a lot of fun with that one. Want to give a shout out, as always, to Gabe on the boards. And he's the one that puts together all the great stuff. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you. And I appreciate all of you in the chat. I appreciate all of you watching. And if you're watching later on the recording or you're listening to the audio, mark your calendars for October the first Tuesday of the month, 8 p.m. Eastern there it is. If you have comments, if you want to respond, if you, you know, you see me reading some of these comments as we go, those come from discussion questions in the martial arts radio behind the scenes group. And if you're not in over there, go ahead, jump in that group. You do have to be approved. So, you know, no spammers or anything like that, but go ahead, join that group. Whistle kick martial arts radio behind the scenes. And you'll see Gabe post a different question there once a week. And that, is some of the material that we use on this show. I think that's a good place to end it. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. And I will talk to and see most of you, I'm sure, at some point in the next month. But if not, I'll see you for October's one-year anniversary, the 13th installment of Whistle Kit Live. Take care, everybody.